And dear Lord, you've also created a new life in you, dear Father, for Lily. And we just ask that you be with her and bless her in her journey with you, dear Father, as she walks with you the remainder of this earth's history and through the pearly gates with you, dear Father. We just ask that you be with her in a very, very special way. Lord, as we're here also, we are uh, we know those that are coming forward, dear Father. They have burdens on their heart. They, some of them may have praises that they want to just glorify you with. Um, Lord, we just ask that you take them all and uh, be with them in whatever their challenges are. Work it out, dear Father, to your honor and glory. We trust in you, dear Father, to work out the best in our lives as well as many others throughout history you have done. Lord, be with us now, and uh, we ask that you be with uh, Pastor Doug as he speaks today. May your, your Holy Spirit be upon him as he shares the word today, that we may take something home and throughout eternity from what he shares with us today. Thank you again. Be with us now as we uh, look up to you on this wonderful Sabbath day. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Did any of you get to see the uh, amazing adventure programs that Pastor Ross and I put on? See some of the families. Oh, good. We're so glad. Did, did some of you not even know we were gone? <laughs> Come on, fess up. We just had a, it was a wonderful experience um, working with the Michigan Conference there and doing these children's meeting. And it was, we never knew what was going to happen. It was not scripted. And uh, we had a, a lot of living, breathing energy in uh, some nights. I think we had 250 young people, uh, junior age, and so we produced some new programs. I hope you'll pray for those. We're hoping the new lessons, Bibles, programs are going to be reaching kids for years to come. But it was, it was a delight to do that, and it is good to be home with you again. This morning we're going to be talking about a subject. I was surprised as I went through the Bible and saw how many times it talked about that three-letter word, pit, about people who are caught in the pit and how God saves from the pit. You know, I remember uh, we had some neighbors when I was a kid in Florida, and it was the Mackle family. Um, didn't know much about them until they became front-page national news when their daughter, Barbara Jane Mackle, was kidnapped while she was attending school. She was 20 years old. Uh, up in Atlanta, and uh, the people had carefully planned this kidnapping. They had built a fiberglass coffin, a little bigger than a coffin, but not much bigger. Uh, had uh, some air they pumped into it, and gave her some water, put some sedatives in the water so that she wouldn't panic too much, and a little fan. The battery went out eventually. A light in the battery went out, and uh, they put her in there, and they buried her alive, basically, and they were not going to divulge her location uh, unless the parents paid $500,000. Well, now back in 1968, that was about $3.5 million in today's terms. The parents did come up with the money. They wanted it to be old, unmarked $20 bills, and they had the ransom. The ransom drop all went sideways because a police officer that didn't know he wasn't supposed to be involved thought it looked very suspicious, this person picking up this money late at night and started chasing the kidnappers. But um, eventually they were apprehended and they located Barbara, but she spent 80 hours, uh, 72 hours is three days, is that right? Over three days basically buried alive, not knowing if anyone would come back. She never lost faith, um, but that'd be terrible. And how happy she was when the authorities arrived and they removed the dirt and uh, found that she was still doing well. Just buried in a box like that, saved from the pit. You know, there's a story about a famous Old Testament prophet that had a similar experience. 
Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 38. Jeremiah, chapter 38. We're going to read the first few verses here. We'll probably read verses uh, 1 to 7. And let me give you the background. Jeremiah was called at a young age as a prophet of God. And he lived during a time where there was great apostasy in Israel. And his message was one of pleading with the people to return to the Lord. And finally, when because of their sins they wouldn't return to the Lord, uh, he said that judgment was coming. The Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans, were going to conquer them. And uh, you know, some of the leaders in Israel were becoming exasperated at Jeremiah because the false prophets were saying, don't submit to the king of Babylon. Don't pay taxes to the king of Babylon. Even though Zedekiah the king had made a covenant in the name of the Lord, he would do that. They broke their covenant. They re rebelled against the king of Babylon. And Jeremiah said, wrath is coming upon you. But if you surrender, if you submit, even now God will show you mercy. Uh, you may get carried away as a captive, but you'll live. And so he was sharing this message while the Babylonians had surrounded Jerusalem. Jeremiah was saying, surrender and live. Well, you know, if you're fighting an enemy and you get someone in your group and they're saying surrender, they saw that as treacherous. They saw that as treason. They, saw, they said, that's going to demoralize our soldiers. And Jeremiah said, look, take that up with the Lord. The Lord is telling me what to tell you. You've rebelled against the king of Babylon. You made a covenant. You're being oppressed because of your disobedience. But if you want to live, surrender and you'll live. So this is where our story takes up in Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 1. Now Shephathiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Micaiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, He who remains in this city will die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over the, to the Chaldeans, if you surrender, to the Chaldeans, you will live, and his life will be a prize for him, and he will live. Thus says the Lord, this city will surely be given to the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the princes said to the king, Please let this man be put to death, for he's weakening the hands of the men of war who remain in the city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of the people, but their harm. Then Zedekiah the king said, Look, he's in your hand, for the king can do nothing against you. The princes were kind of rising up against the king. So they took Jeremiah. They thought, well, maybe he is a prophet. We don't want the blood of a prophet on our hands. So we're not going to kill him, but we're <laughs> kind of like Joseph's brothers. We won't kill him. We'll just throw him in a pit. And so they took Jeremiah, verse 6, and they cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. Now in some of these ancient dungeons there was a cistern. So they used to capture the water and they'd run it all into these cisterns. And this is not the water that was used for drinking. They would use the spring water for that. But they used that water for, you know, watering the animals or for washing. And... Uh, and sometimes those cisterns were dry if there wasn't rain. Sometimes they were abandoned and it sort of became a catch-all for everything. And all the muck and the mire would gather in there. And, and they lowered, they tied Jeremiah up with these rough hemp ropes and they cut his skin and they lowered him down in there roughly. And they dropped him and threw the rope in after him. And he sank into the mire. Now the problem with that is not only does it stink, a uh, mire was uh, just a little better than sewer water. But uh, you couldn't sit down because he'd just be sitting in muck and it, who knows, it may have come up to his knees. It says he sank down into it. So you just got to stand and lean against the wall and listen to the flies and smell the stench. And it was a very depressing situation, as you can imagine. Sweltering, hot, smelly, feeling abandoned, dark. And they abandoned him there. Now everyone in the city is starving. They're surrounded by enemies. Who's going to care about him? So Jeremiah sank down in the mire. Have you ever felt like you were in the pits? <laughs> Sometimes life is the pits. You've heard that? 
I like grapes and olives, but I don't like the pits. And Jeremiah was literally in the mire, in the pit. You know, this is a story of how God saves us from the pit. The children of Israel, when they were in Egypt, what was their principal work? Away in the mire, away in the clay. You ever heard that song? God leads his people along. They were down in these clay pits. And they would m mash the clay up with their feet. And they, they would labor there in the sun. And God saved them from the mire and the clay. Saved them from the pit of their prison. And the Jeremiah was down in the pit. This is a symbol for being in a lost condition. A symbol for being in sin. Now there are principally three kinds of sin, three pits of sin you might say in the Bible. You can read in 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, and here it comes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father but of the world. And the world will pass away, and the lust thereof but he that does the will of God will abide forever. Basically, it's talking about the three areas of sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Uh, some have summarized it as passions, possessions, and positions. When Eve fell, go in your Bible to Genesis chapter 6. No, so Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis 3, 6. You remember there was that forbidden tree. And it says, when she was finally enticed to eat, there was three areas that sort of put her over the edge. So the woman saw the tree was good for food. It looked like it would be tasty. Smelled good. Lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes. And a tree desired to make one wise. I mean, after all, the devil had just said, you'll be like God's, the position of power that you'd have. Same three areas. Which, by the way, are the same three areas where Jesus was tempted by the devil and he overcame, reminding us that Jesus can save us from any sin. All sin sort of falls into one of those three categories. That actually gives me relief because if you told me you've got to overcome you know, 365 different sins, that could be discouraging. But if you said you've only got three, well, it makes it a little easier. I remember when uh, I lived up in the mountains in a cave. I looked at it on Google Earth last night. I wanted to see if I could see it from Google Earth satellite view, and I could. Um, it, it was a very steep section of the canyon. We called it the second canyon, and you could not just go up the canyon because there were three waterfalls, smooth sides. We called it three pools. And it sounds very attractive, but it was actually very dangerous. Um, what would happen is hikers, and especially in the wintertime, the mountain is 11,000 feet high, Mount San Jacinto. Any of you ever been to Idlewild in Southern California? It's up on the back side of this. This is the desert side. Snow on that mountain. You don't think about snow in Southern California, but the water was very cold. It's from melted snow. And it had washed the canyon walls almost perfectly smooth. And people typically, when they're going down the mountains, they follow the creek. Well, they would go follow the creek and they'd say, oh, look, uh, you, if I could get down to that pool, it was real slick sides of getting down to the pool, I can go around, swim through the pool, and, and keep on hiking. But what they didn't know is around the corner was another waterfall and another pool, and you couldn't go back because you had slid down, unless you had ropes or climbing gear. And a lot of people died because they'd try and go hiking down through three pools and they'd realize they couldn't get up uh, or they'd try to jump over the falls into the next pool and they get stuck in the cold water and they'd have a heart attack. I actually met a girl up there once, a waitress who had been lost for several days who had tried to go down the canyon in three pools and I ended up uh, kind of escorting her all the way out of the canyon showing her where the trails are. You get these three areas where people get trapped. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's about passion, possession, and position. We're going to talk about this a little bit. First of all, the pit of lust. 
Proverbs 22, 14. The mouth of an immoral woman is a deep pit, and he is arbored by the Lord will fall there. Now, when I say lust of the flesh, many of us automatically think of things like sexual lust. Uh, it might be pornography. It might be pastry. It's any kind of physical attraction. Proverbs 23, verse 27. For a harlot is a deep pit, and a seductress is a narrow well. And so, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've got a really neat mouse trap up in the hills. Uh, you, they say you can't improve on a mouse trap, but we found something that I think is a little better. Um, you take a five-gallon bucket. Any of you have problems with mice? You don't have to raise your hand. But um, get a five-gallon bucket. You fill it with about five inches of water. And then you make a little plank of plastic. It's got to be smooth plastic. It's got a pivot on it. Got a magnet on one end. I know I really should have brought a diagram. But you can adjust the magnet with a screw so that the magnet is just barely holding the plank down and it's on a hinge. On the end of the hinge, you put peanut butter. Do not use the natural peanut butter. Use the bad peanut butter, the stuff with the sugar and the hydrogenated. The mice love that. They don't care about their arteries. They're going to die before it's a problem for them anyway. And so you put that out on the end of the plank, and the mouse smells it. You can even just put a little around the edge. He smells it. He sees a big gob out there, and he goes out, and he doesn't realize that even mice do weigh something. And when he gets out on the end, you know, I, I've got it adjusted so that just the weight of the mouse plus the peanut butter, you've got to take into account how much that peanut butter weighs. He gets out on the end. He cannot resist, and it flips, and it drops him off in the bucket. You got to have enough water. I know you're a poor little mouse. I'm sorry. You're going to report me? <laughs> Peter will be protesting at my door. And he drops off in there and uh, ultimately drowns. Falls into the pit because he cannot resist the peanut butter. Now we're smiling because we're talking about mice, but uh, mice aren't the only ones that have trouble with the lusts of the flesh. There's a lot of people. Yes, Christians too. God made us with physical bodies and they have physical needs and desires. And God designed, you know, the devil did not invent sex. God did. But it's to be treated in the appropriate sphere within the, the covenant of marriage. And God invented food and taste buds. He wants you to enjoy food. The Bible talks about both sex and food as things that can be pleasant the way God designed them. But anything outside of God's design, gluttony or pornography, they can become pits that trap people and drown them in perdition. And a lot of folks are needing help escaping the mire of the lusts of the flesh. Um, you know, more people in North America are dying now not from malnutrition but from overeating. Most of the hospital visits now are connected with obesity as opposed to malnutrition. Used to be people were struggling with rickets and all these problems growing up with malnutrition. And now it's too much. Someone told me one third of the internet downloads is pornographic material. Um, its accessibility has just made it an epidemic in our culture. And you know, in spite of how prevalent it is, God's word has not changed. God is calling on Christians to be pure in heart also wants us to have control over our appetites and our passions. Then you've got the pit of greed. 1 Timothy 8, uh, chapter 6, sorry, verse 8 through 10. You all know this. And having food and clothing, with these we should be content. But those who desire to be rich, they long to be rich. Now you may work hard and get rich, but if your goal is being rich, there's something wrong with that. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. They fall into a pit and a snare, and many foolish and harmful lusts, one thing leads to another, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, and I'm not money in itself, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. <laughs> Solomon had a lot of money, but you read Ecclesiastes and you can see 
that at the end of his life he realized that he had pierced himself through with many sorrows. Having that um, wisdom and the power and the possessions, uh, it led to um, all kinds of problems. It, it almost led to a cynicism. What was it that brought about the fall of Judas? He sold the Savior for silver and that's not very wise. I remember hearing a story about a white knight that was traveling through the countryside and he came upon a village and they were so happy to see him and they said, could you please deliver us from the ogre that lives in the pit? He, we hear the shrieks and the moans and he's been tormenting our community and he comes out at night and haunts us. And they said, several champions have gone down in the pit to destroy him but we don't recall any ever coming out again. Well, this knight was brave and he was looking for some adventure and challenge, wanted to make a name for himself. So the villagers directed him where the mouth of the ogre's pit was. And it was a very narrow entrance and he could see it was very deep. So he needed a rope and he also would have to strip himself of his armor just to get through the narrow entrance. But he did take a dagger with him that he tied around his neck so that he could do a battle with the little fiend at the bottom of the pit. It went down quite a ways and it got dark as he went down. Lowered himself by his long rope and uh, as he neared the bottom, before he released himself, it looked like there was a mound. It looked like two mounds actually. One mound with some glitter and another mound glittering off to the left. And as he got a little closer, he dropped himself down on the first mound and he thought, oh, this is a mound of bones. And he could see the glitter was the armor and the weapons of others who had evidently come down to kill the ogre and it didn't end very well. And then he heard a shriek and he saw the ogre and he was shocked. The ogre was no bigger than a rabbit. It jumped up and screamed and waved its little arms and he grabbed for his dagger and the ogre saw he had a dagger and he ran and dove in to another remote recess of the cave. It's a true story. <laughs> I can see you're on the edge of your seats. <laughs> so as he went over to fight the ogre he saw the second mound and he, he, he realized this is a mound. It was of gold, bars, silver, jewels, rubies, diamonds as big as tennis balls. And he thought to himself, forget about the ogre. He said, he's no threat. These people are scared of this little bitty ogre as big as a rabbit. He's not going to hurt anybody. He says, there's treasure here. He's trying to figure out how he could take some out with him. And so he was wearing, you know, the, his undergarments. So he tied off several gold bars into his underwear. And before he walked away from the mound, he thought, I've got to get one of those diamonds. Uh, rubies aren't worth as much. So he put a diamond in his mouth. Had nowhere else to hold it. And he began to climb the rope, first just breathing through his nose. And eventually he got to the point where he could not breathe and he was gasping for air halfway up and he sucked the diamond into his throat and before he lost consciousness and fell, he thought, was it worth it? And his body was among the others that had fallen on the pit. They thought that the town was being haunted by an ogre in the pit. The ogre was greed. That's what had been slain the mighty. And a lot of people have been destroyed by the same. Then you've got a pit of pride. Proverbs 16 verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. People, it's the power of position. It's the titles. I think it was Spurgeon that said uh, we should never be deceived by somebody's uh, race or space or face. <laughs> Second Samuel 18 verse 17 and they took Absalom. You know how Absalom ended badly? He wanted his father's position. He's proud of his beauty, his appearance, his title. Had 50 men running before him. He wanted to be king like the devil who said, I will be like the Most High. And Absalom's rebellion ended up in a fall. He died suspended between heaven and earth. And they took his body and they cast him into a large pit in the woods. And they laid a very large heap of stones over him 
and all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Oh, while I was thinking about greed, I just thought about Achan. You know Achan? He was greedy for the, the spoils of Jericho. He ended in a pit too, didn't he? So if you find yourself in one of these pits, I think it's helpful to remember that Jesus overcame and with His help we can overcome. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. How do you do it? Well, for one thing you ask. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Now if you want to read about Jeremiah's prayer from the pit, you don't actually find it in Jeremiah. You find it in the book Lamentations, also written by Jeremiah. It's in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 52. And he prays and he says, My enemies without cause hunted me down like a bird. They silenced my life in the pit. They threw stones at me. The waters flowed over my head. I said, I am cut off. And here's the key. I called on your name, O Lord, from the lowest pit, and you have heard my voice. So if you find yourself in the lowest pit, it's the deepest pit with like the tar pits, <laughs> you're stuck in the mire. What do you do? Call on the Lord. The Bible talks about um, Psalm 69 verse 1 and 2. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink deep in the mire where there is no standing. I've come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Did David know what it felt like to be in the pits where it looked like there was no help? Some also get, I should add, there's a pit of discouragement. Sometimes we can just become overwhelmed with our own failures. It feels like the floods will overwhelm you. Jonah, talk about being in a deep pit. Uh, if you get swallowed by a fish and you're still alive, that's the pits. And you're praying that the fish will spit the pit out. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the fish's belly. And you go to the end of chapter 2 and he says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The mooring is where you tie something off. You tie up a boat. It means the place where the mountains are tied off to the earth, the very bottom of the mountains in the ocean. You know where the tallest mountain in the world is? It's in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, it's Mauna Loa or Mauna Kea. Which one's taller? Mauna Kea? Yeah. It's really the two big islands. Hawaii is really two volcanoes side by side. Uh, you go down off the coast of Hawaii, if you count from the seafloor, it's taller than Mount Everest. It's over 38,000 feet from the seafloor below Hawaii up to the top of Mauna Kea. And uh, the Bible says God will take our sins and cast them into the depths of the sea. Even though they might be like a mountain, you can move by faith. Jonah was at the bottom and it says, He prayed to the Lord. You have brought me up from the pit, O Lord my God. You know, after he prayed that prayer, God answered his prayer and the fish surfaced. Peter knows what it's like to be sinking. You know the story. Matthew chapter 14. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, in the darkest time, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. I mean, they thought their problems had gone from bad to worse. They're, they're out in the middle of the water in the middle of the night. And then the ghost comes. Where do you run? But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. That's interesting. You only find this here. So he said, Come. And there's really no time you can find in the Bible when someone says, Lord, can I do this? He said, Sure. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But here's where things turned. Peter took his eyes off Christ. Uh, I have a theory I can't prove, but I, I think when Peter was walking on the water, uh, a little bit of pride came into his heart, and he thought, I'm the only one besides Jesus walking on water. I wonder if the other guys are getting this on their iPhones. And he turned around and said, hey, what do you think? Look at this. <laughs> Whenever you hear 
a man say, y'all watch this, you better get your camera out. <laughs> and as soon as Peter turned to see if they were looking, he took his eyes off Jesus and he saw the wind and the waves were boisterous. He began to look at the problem and he was afraid. He lost faith. When his faith started to sink, he started to sink. And he cried out then and he prayed like Jonah, like Jeremiah, and he said, Lord, save me. This is actually the second shortest prayer in the Bible. I think Jehoshaphat, usher, he issues a prayer that simply says, Lord, help, when he was in battle. Peter says, Lord, save me. So to, to get an answer from God, do you have to have a long, eloquent prayer with a lot of sophisticated words? What makes your prayers valuable to God? the eloquence, your vocabulary, or your desperation? Your sincerity. Lord, save me. Sometimes you're out on the highway and you see you're about to have an accident, you just pray. And immediately, Jesus didn't say, all right, there's a waiting period, or he would have sunk. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And they got back to the boat, the wind ceased. So in the waters when you're sinking, in the pit, the bottom of the ocean, you can pray. Whatever your pit is, you come to the Lord as you are. And you might have to pray more than once. You know, the Bible talks about Joseph being cast in the pit. Genesis 37, verse 24. It might be because of the decision others have made you're in the pit that you're in. And his brothers took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. The other thing is when you pray, you don't know exactly how God is going to answer that prayer. In the story of Jeremiah, I want you to turn back now, and it introduces another character. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 38. And uh, where we left our hero, it says he sank in the mire. And verse 7 begins... Now Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, he heard when they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. Now Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, he loved the Lord. And he believed in Jehovah. And when he heard what had happened to Jeremiah, he went to the king. Now, don't you all wish that you had an Ebed-Melech, a friend that will intercede with the king for you when you're in the pit. Some people are only going to get out of the pit because somebody else outside of the pit is interceding for them. And he had a friend. The name Ebed Melech, it means servant of the king. By the way, you know what Yahweh, uh, Jeremiah means? Jeremiah means may Yahweh lift up. So if you got the name Jeremiah, there's a good chance you're going to get out of the pit. Now Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, he was in the king's house, he heard that they put Jeremiah in the dungeon. And when the king was sitting at the gate, Benjamin, Ebed Melech went out to the king's house and he spoke to the king, saying, My lord, king, these men have done evil in all that they've done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. He is likely to die from hunger in this place where he is, for there's no more bread in the city. He said, Even the people in the city have no bread. How much chance is there a prisoner going to get any bread or water? There's nothing to drink in there. He can't drink the mire. He's going to die. Well, that's what the, the enemies of Jeremiah wanted. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take from here 30 men with you, in case anyone tries to stop you. You know, Zedekiah, you read on in the story, he believed Jeremiah, but he didn't have the backbone to stand up for him. He said, Take with you 30 men and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. Now, you know, somebody went to the king and interceded, and the king answered their prayer. So you can pray, and you may know others that are in the pit, and you can pray for them. You can pray when you're in the pit, and you can pray for others that are in the pit. Amen? So Ebed Melech, he took the men with him, and he went to the house of the king under the treasury, and from there he got some old clothes and rags, and he let them down by ropes to the dungeon to Jeremiah. Then Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. Why? 
because he'd already been cut and, and burned by the ropes when they put him in the pit. And he's saying, this is going to make it easier for you. He's going to pull them out gently. Put him under your armpits. So they pulled Jeremiah with the ropes and they lifted him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. And uh, it goes on to say he stayed there until Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. And among the few people that were spared in the city, Jeremiah was one of them. Isn't that interesting? The king comes and he conquers the city and he, he punishes the king and the elders and the priests. Everybody has judgment. But he sees Jeremiah in the prison. And someone says, he was the one that stood up for the Lord. He sets him free. It's kind of interesting that when the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians, the one who's spared is Daniel the prophet. And when uh, the Babylonians conquer Israel, Jeremiah is spared. Now something else interesting happens here. Because Ibn Melech cared about others, even during this time, God gave a special promise to him. He's sent, there's part of Jeremiah that is written as a prophecy for Ibn Melech. It says, Go speak, and this is Jeremiah 39, verse 16. Go speak to Ibn Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words to pass on this city for adversity and not for good, and they'll be performed in that day before you. But I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord. And you will not be given into the man, into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you will not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. In working to save others, he saved himself. You catch that? So in this story, uh, if you're in the pit, you want to be praying from the pit and praying you've got friends that will intercede in your behalf. If you feel like you've been saved from the pit, what's your next job? To intercede for and to do all you can to pull the other people out of the pit. Someone once said that evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. And the first thing you're going to want to do if you've been saved from the pit is to help get other people out. God showed mercy on this man whose name was servant of the king because he had been involved in saving others. You know, it's interesting then, the king calls Jeremiah. You read on in the story, and I won't read all these verses. The king calls Jeremiah again. He says, I, I want to talk to you. Tell me once more, what is the word of the Lord? And Jeremiah said, well, you know, if the princes find out that I'm talking to you, they're going to kill me. The king says, no, you can just tell them that uh, you are appealing to me, that you don't go back to the cistern, the dungeon, the mire again, which was true. And, uh, the thing that struck me was in one day Jeremiah goes from the mire through the intercession of Ebed Melech he ends up in the palace and later that day he's in the temple and I looked at the different examples in the Bible of how many people went through a transition like that Daniel goes from being a captive to being prime minister in one day Daniel goes from the lion's den to the palace doesn't he Joseph goes from the prison he changed his clothes and he shaved and he's brought before Pharaoh and he becomes prime minister in one day. The apostles were in prison about to be judged but the angel opened the prison door and said go to the house of the Lord and preach these words. They go from the prison to the palace in one day. So when you're saved from the pit you don't go to limbo or purgatory. You're either saved or lost. Jesus says you're with me or against me. And so they went from the pit to the presence of the king. Now Jesus came to save us from the pit of sin. Matthew 12, and we actually read this during Sabbath school, What man is there among you who has one sheep, if he falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep or a bird or a goat? And Jesus said, look, if you care about your animals and you bring them out of the pit, doesn't our good shepherd care about his sheep? Doesn't the shepherd go and leave all the other lambs to look for that one lost lamb? How interested is God in getting you out? Job 33 verse 24. For he is gracious to him and says, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Even in the book of Job it says that God has found a ransom to get us out of the pit. Look in Isaiah 38 verse 17. 
For you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all of my sins behind your back. All right, is it clear now? I told you the word pit, and I'm not reading half of them. Get your Bible computer, type in pit, <laughs> and you'll be surprised. It equates it with the sin, being trapped by sin. And he says, you've cast all my sins behind your back. Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 11. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. And it says, Joseph went in the pit and it was dry. It means there's no life in the pit. So if God can save Jonah and Jeremiah and Joseph and all the others from their pits, can he save you from your pit? It doesn't matter whether it's passion or possessions or positions. Whatever it is that's distracting you, he can save you from that. But some people have trouble believing that God can get them out of their pit. I remember reading the evangelist and preacher G. Campbell Morgan was doing some revival meetings in uh, Scotland by, there were some miners. And this one miner came up, he said, Pastor Campbell, he said, I just tell you, I, I, I have an awful hard time believing that all I need to do is ask and that God is going to forgive me and save me. He says, it seems too easy. It seems too cheap. And Pastor Morgan said, you're a miner, right? He says, that's right. He said, and how did you get out of the mine yesterday? He said, I took the elevator. He said, well, uh, how much did that cost you? Well, he said, it doesn't cost me anything to take the shaft elevator. He said, so the elevator is, was free? It didn't cost anything? He said, oh no, the elevator was very expensive. They spent a lot of money building that elevator. He said, but you just had to get on it, right? Finally dawned on him. He said, salvation is very expensive. Uh, Jesus paid for it, but it's free for you because He loves you. God doesn't want to leave you in the pit. You know when the, some of the highest television ratings in the world were? When the last of the 33 miners, you remember that in 2010? The last of those 33 miners were brought up out of the pit, two billion people were watching around the world. You know, they spent uh, 70 days, they broke a record for the largest amount of time anyone would be trapped below ground. They were about a half a mile below ground. When there was a cave in, there was no way out, no communications. And there was a long period of time before they sunk the first well that could just send a message down. They sent a message back saying, we're alive, 33 of us. You remember that? It's a great story. But there was a long period of time when they were down there, they had no idea that everybody above was engaged in trying to rescue them. Sometimes we wonder, does anyone out there care? Is there any hope for me? And we have no idea. You know, all of heaven is engaged in trying to save the lost world. You may not know it because we're in the pits. But God and His angels in heaven is extremely interested in the redemption of this world because their commander loved it so much he came into the world to become one of us to save us. You got to want to get out. Um, those miners that were saved also had to take a step of faith. They had to get into a cage that was lowered down <laughs> and be willing to get out. And at any time they knew there could be another earthquake and they could get crushed halfway up. So there was some risk involved. Some people are in the pit uh, because they like it. You heard the story, I probably told it a hundred times, about the frog that was hopping along carelessly one day and he fell into a pit. Uh, he hopped and hopped and he couldn't get out. He didn't mind so much because plenty of bugs, bugs crawled into the pit and so he had plenty to eat. So he got to where he's kind of comfortable down there. But he got tired and every now and then he'd call out and he'd say, help, help. And one day a, a turtle came by slowly and craned his neck over the edge. He looked down in the pit and he saw the frog. Another true story. <laughs> and uh, he, um, he said, what's the problem? The frog said, well, I hope it would be obvious. He says, I'm stuck in this pit and I can't get out. He said, well, can't you hop out? He says, I've tried. I just can't hop high enough. He said, well, what do you want me to do? The frog said to the turtle, well, if you'd go get a stick in your mouth and drop it in here, I could crawl out. The turtle said, I'll be right back. But you know, for turtles, that's relative. 
So about an hour later, the turtle's making his way back to the edge of the hole, and he's got a stick in his mouth, and before he gets to the hole, he sees the frog. He's there sunbathing on a rock up on the side. And the turtle said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm sunbathing. He said, well, how'd you get here? He said, I hopped out of the hole. He said, you told me you couldn't get out of the hole. He said, well, that was until the snake crawled in. He said, I had to get out. <laughs> Sometimes if we would only know that the wages of sin are truly death, we'd get motivated. But we keep thinking we've got plenty of time to hop out. We don't understand the desperation of the situation. And some people, they stay in the pit because they say, I tried before and it's hopeless, I can't get out. I got another frog story. It's actually a poem. <laughs> Two frogs fell in a can of cream, or so I heard it told. The sides of the can were shiny and steep. The cream was deep and cold. The first frog croaked, oh, what's the use? Tis fate, no helps around. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye, sad world. And weeping still, he drowned. But the other frog of sterner stuff dog paddled in surprise. And while he wiped his creamy face and he dried his creamy eyes, I'll swim as long as I can swim, or so I've heard he said. It really wouldn't help the world if one more frog was dead. An hour or two he kicked and swam, not once to stop and mutter, but he kicked and kicked and swam and kicked. Then he hopped out via butter. He finally turned that cream into butter by swimming. <laughs> you got to want to get out. You know, something else, just the way the story ends, when Nebuchadnezzar took the city, those who put Jeremiah in the pit were killed. Jeremiah was spared. The Bible says that uh, if you dig a pit for someone to fall into, you will fall in the pit that you dig. Psalm 7, verse 14, Behold the wicked, he's made a pit and dug it out. He's fallen into the ditch which, which he had made. You know, the book of Esther, Haman was hung on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. Proverbs 26, 27, Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. How's the devil going to end? Isaiah 14, You will be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Daniel was brought out of his pit, and who was thrown in? The ones who had accused him. Revelation 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, the devil and Satan, and bound him. Ezekiel 28, talking about the devil, They will throw you down in the pit, you will die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. He talks about the water in the pit. You tried to drown them in the mire, and you're going to drown yourself. You know, I'll end with this story. Uh, some of you remember reading about this little baby, Jessica. It's been just about 30 years ago now, back in 1987. An 18-month-old, it's been more than 30 years ago, 18-month-old toddler. How many of you remember this story? You're old enough. Some of you younger ones, you don't remember this. Let me tell you, it was something. A little toddler in Midland, Texas, was playing in her aunt's yard, and it was a big backyard, and there was someone had uncovered uh, a closed well, an oil well. If you've ever been to Midland, you can smell when you get to Midland, Texas, in Odessa, because they got oil wells everywhere. Anyone been there? You know what I'm talking about. And there was an abandoned oil well, very deep, the cover had come off, and this toddler fell way down in the well. And word eventually reached the local papers, and then it got to a wider paper that they were trying to get this baby out of the well. And soon it made national news. This was one of the first nationally covered 24-hour-a-day stories in North America. They had the satellite technology then to carry it. And there was a, a circus of news agencies that descended they lowered down a light and a camera. They could see that she was still alive, but she was just totally wedged, covered with oil, grease, and grime, stuck in this hole. And uh, uh, they put a light down there. Now, you know, the light, uh, the, the air, once you get like six feet down, it's like 50 degrees, the ground temperature. She was 22 feet down, so it was very cold. And eventually, you could die from hyperthermia. So they began to blow warm air in. 
They lowered down a little microphone so her mom could talk to her. Uh, they felt great encouragement when they heard her singing Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> she was just old enough where she had learned Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, and she was singing that. And that gave them great hope. But there was no way for them to get her out. They put a camera down there. They tried to figure out, can we get a lariat around her wrist and pull her out? No full-grown man could go down there and get her. And meanwhile, the hours are ticking by and they wonder how long can she last. They brought in well drillers and, and uh, ultimately they came up with a solution to drill another well through solid rock right beside her well, lower a man down. He had to go down deeper than she was so then he could go up, drill across horizontally up to where the baby was and all of this was just, you know, best guess estimates and eventually they were able to rescue uh, little baby Jessica who is alive and well today and a mother of her own. But um, the interesting thing was the only way they could get her out was they had to get a volunteer to go back down. You know, even with the 33 miners, when they dug that shaft and they made the cage to save the miners, one man had to go down and bring the gear and tell them how they were going to be saved. Someone had to go down. And that's what Jesus did. He came into our world that He might save us from our pit. Now, I don't know what kind of pit you're in, but whatever it is, He's in the business of saving. If we ask Him, maybe you know some others that are in the pit. They need your intercession. They need a friend. And uh, I think this is a good opportunity for us to say, today is the day I want the Lord to save me from my pits. Is that your desire? Now, we're going to do something different. I'm going out on a limb here. We're going to sing a song that's not in the hymnal, but how many of you know the song, Love Lifted Me? We're borrowed from the Methodist hymnal. If you don't, the words are on the screen. Our song leaders are going to come. They know it. We're going to stand together and sing this song. I think by the second verse, you're going to love the tune. And let's raise the roof. Me when 
Jesus came into our world. We love him because he first loved us. Moses went to the slavery of Egypt to bring them out. Just like they lowered somebody down to bring the others out. Jesus has come to where we are to reach us. And the goodness of God, his love, leads us to repentance. Uh, everybody's really included today. We all fall into one of those categories. Maybe we are in multiple pits. But whatever they are, Jesus came to save us. And he can if we ask you. And we also, once we've got our feet on solid ground, we need to be praying for those that are still caught in the mire and in the pit. That's the purpose of this church. It's the purpose of the gospel is to help set people free. How many of you want to say, Lord, save me and help me to reach others that are in the pits of sin. Father in heaven, we thank you for this simple message of the gospel, the power of your love to save. Help us, Lord, not to minimize how awful it is to be buried alive in the pit, to be trapped and hopeless. But I pray that we'll also not underestimate your power to reach even those who are in the deepest depths of sin. Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be with those who may be struggling. Uh, we all struggle with temptation, Lord. Uh, some, it's passion. It might be possessions. It might be pride and position. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you will help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to take hold of the rope of salvation that you've lowered and let you lift us from the pit of sin. Please bless, Lord. I pray that uh, like Ibn Malik, we'll be friends and intercede for those that are still trapped. We have loved ones and family that are wrestling with various uh, sins and temptation. Set them free. And I pray this can be a place in a church where the gospel goes forth we thank you, we pray all this in Jesus' name, and we praise you. Amen. You may be seated. Just give us a chance to get to the door so the elders can greet you. God bless and happy Sabbath.